Kevin Moore. I'm a Humanity Rising Ambassador and the founder of Hashtag Race to Speak Up, an anti-bullying organization. Humanity Rising is a student-led movement to create a better world through service. We help students find their service passion and give them a voice to help them share what they are doing to make a positive difference in the world. Welcome to our Creating World Peace Through Unity Humanity Rising Voices podcast series, hosted by Steve Serlitz. We're really happy to see you all here today. Joining Steve is James Gibson. James was 23 years old when he was forced to confess a double homicide he did not commit. Now, James discusses how the power of forgiveness kept him from becoming resentful and how fortitude and resilience developed him as a leader and advocate for those who are wrongfully accused. There will be time for Q&A and now I'll turn it over to Steve to begin. Well, James, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. It's been a long time since we hung out. Last night. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just want to say that I continue to be so impressed with you. And for those of you who didn't understand my comment I made is that song was James' song. Not just a song he was playing, it was a song he wrote. And uh, yes, he's a man of many talents. Um, the world was deprived for a long time to a large part of those talents. So I, I guess my first question is, James, why don't you, in your own words, tell a little bit about your, your story and, you know, just go into a little bit more detail about what, about the history, about, about your life and, and kind of what got you to this place. Well, uh, first, I want to thank you, Steve, for welcoming me to this, to this platform. I want to thank all the young people that's out there listening. And I want to thank all the women and the children around the world. My name is James Gibson. My mother named me James Grant Gibson. I go by many names. Some call me James Grant Consultant. Some call me James Grant Publishing. Some call me James Grant Entertainment. Some call me CMOS. But today I'm James Grant Gibson. And the reason that I, I repeat myself is because I had to repeat myself in court three times. So when the court addressed me, they addressed me as Gibson one, Gibson two, Gibson three. I'm the first case in the nation in 300 years where, they, where African American has ever proven and collaborated torture since the abolition of slavery. I have since been issued a certificate of innocence and exoneration. My story is not just like every other story in America, a tragedy. I was stolen from my family at an age where I, I was just trying to get my life together. I had graduated out of high school with honors and had attended college for a semester or two and I was trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. Um, I come from the south side of Chicago, 57th and Aberdeen. My mother had built a home in 1966, a deaf lady with no help. Uh, for those who don't know, I never told anyone in the last 30 years that my mother couldn't hear. And so all through my walk uh, of incarceration and false imprisonment and torture, I never told anyone that my mother couldn't hear. And so in 1966, my mother brought her home on the south side of Chicago. And like any other uh, person in America, you know, because this is not a black issue, this is not a white issue, this is a human issue. And so she tried with the cost that was dealt to her the best that she could, even though she was handicapped and she couldn't hear. And so I was stolen from my mother in 1989 <clears throat> and I was falsely accused and imprisoned for 30 years in which I fought for 27 years to clear my name and, and issue a certificate of innocence and exoneration. I was offered five deals in which I turned them all down. So where do I begin with this story? Uh, because unlike the public or ordinary person, I had no one to talk to. I couldn't call my mother like the average person could. I couldn't get that teaching and education, that love and support through a phone call like everybody else. And so I talked to myself. And then one day, for legal reasons, I can't go too much into the case because I'm being, I'm giving depositions in two weeks. Um, the biggest deposition the nation has ever seen. So for legal reasons, I can't go into that part of the 
of the case, but uh, my mother, um, she came up into the point that her body couldn't take it anymore for 12 years. And she told me upon entering the visiting room that I had to get whatever it was in my heart out, that I had to turn to whoever I call or chose to call God. And she told me that, that he goes by many names. She said that some name him, I am. And when they asked him who sent him, she said, I am. But she, she told me that in order for me to come home, in which I was coming home, that I had to get all those things out of my heart. And so for 30 years, I talked to myself. For 32 years, I talked to the, to the nation, to the people. I wrote 10,000 letters to this nation. I wrote every media outlet in this nation. I wrote to the United Nations. I wrote every president for the last 30 years, sitting president. I wrote every local and cable outlet, every senator, every state's attorney, every congressman, every governor, every lieutenant governor. I wrote even the late, great Hugh Hefner. If you pull up the archive, um, he did an issue about it called um, Area 2. And so I go back to my mother had all begun. My mother in which, like I said, she played a pivotal part in this moment in which I'm sitting here today. And when she told me those years long ago that I had to get all that out of my heart and that I had to call on God because I had no one to talk to but God. You see, I come into the system at a time where the drugs, the gangs, they control everything. I was 135 pounds when I came in. Don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen. I used to be a gang banger. I used to sell drugs. You know what I'm saying? I guess you can call it trying to fit in or being bullied, but my story changed. When I, when I left the county jail and entered into the prison system, I can't really explain what had happened to me. I was so overwhelmed by the conditions and the things that I saw, I couldn't fit in. But I never judged anyone. I never discriminated against anyone. And I couldn't understand why we hated so much. But what led me was what my mother kept telling me, you got to get those things out of your heart so that God can be able to do what he needs to do for you because you coming home. And so when I got into prison, I was so confused. I was so lost. And I, and I was like, and I, and I had been taught that, you know, guys in prison, it, it, they live a certain way. They, they up on a code, a, a creed, a, con, a, you know, a concept, an ideology, you know what I'm saying? And that it was like this, it was like that. But I didn't agree with those things. And so I walked among all of the tribes, and I sat at all of the tables and I didn't discriminate. And so I learned and I became what they call a jailhouse lawyer. And so I filed and I filed thousands of petitions to the Supreme Court, the appellate court, the United States Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, the Seventh Circuit for thousands of inmates, the Latinos, the Mexicans, the whites, the blacks, the vice lords, the GDs, the BDs, the L. Rookins, the Latin Kings, the Latin folks, the same disciples, the Aryan nations, the bikers, the North Siders, I'm James Gibson on the land. And so my story had begun when I was taken from the land. And my mother told me that you never left the land, but in order to come back to the land, you got to put God first. You got to love your creator and he's going to instill in you to be able to love others. So I'm James Gibson on the land. James, you talk about your mother all the time. And you know, I feel like I almost have met her um, just because the way you talk about her. How did your mother how did your, your relationship with your mother, how did your mother help you handle this almost impossible situation? My mother, uh, love is the most powerful thing on earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He wrapped himself up in the flesh and came down in all this mess so that he can get a firsthand look on what was going on down here. My mother loved me even in death. She comes to me to this day. Every year I go to an ocean and I meet her somewhere on the planet and she meets me there. My mother, I don't know how she was able to do it. She stood in the gap 
Every last one of us that's listening to this tonight, there's somebody standing in the gap. I can't even explain to the public uh, the love that I have for my mother and she had for me, and we couldn't talk. And so we was to go into, we used to go into a, a quiet place. We used to go into a, a quiet place, and at a certain time, she would enter into my cell and, 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 and console me, so to speak. I could smell her, so to speak. And when she died, before she died and passed away, she wrote me a letter, which I got to this day. And she told me that she was going to transition. And when she transitioned, I was right there with her, walking into the place where my sister cut the braid out of her head. And when she transitioned over and sat where she sat now, it changed the game for me of, of what I was up against, how the, how the system here in Chicago has stacked the deck, how they knew that they had the wrong guy, how they had put me in system for 30 years without no charges on the records so that all this other stuff, which I, I, I can't go to. But my mother, I, I really can't explain it other than love. For, for love is more powerful than death for those who have truly been loved. When you love someone or something, you do the things that a person that does that love that thing or someone. And my, and my bond and my love for my mother in the last part of her life that we couldn't talk, we had created a system and a bond through our spiritual bloodline and ancestry calling on intercession and dimensions and taking us into another levels so that we could communicate without touching or seeing each other because I couldn't call my mother on the phone. And so I can't even explain to this day how um, she's still in my life and, and when I go to that ocean, how she comes and right to this day how I can smell her and how she, you know, she, you know, a mother's love, you know, it's the same thing. I can say this, um, Steve. It's the same thing with the George Floyd issue. When that man put his knee on that man's neck and he hollered, mama, you could have been an a animal, a, a, a mammal, or you could have been a, a dog, a cat, but every mother, every female on this earth resonated with mama. Right now today, if, 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 if you go outside your door and somebody said, mama, everybody gonna stop and look. Every female, her instincts, she gonna stop and look. You know what I'm saying? And, and so that was a, a moment that, 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 that shifted in this country. So I'm going back into love. When this country was founded, it was founded on love. You know what I'm saying? But we, we ain't got it yet. It's so simple. And so my mother, she loved me so much, even in death. I think she had to, she had to, because, because, because I, I am not really telling all the story. See, I had to, I'm still working on myself, trying to get things out of my heart. And just a week ago, I was at the ocean and I sung my song and she told me to sing it over because I hadn't had things out of my heart and I had to sing it over. And so my mother, she, she, when she passed and transitioned, at that time that she transitioned, I was still in a messy place. Because I was, like, I, was, I, was like, I was like blaming everybody but what was going on around me. And so when she transitioned, she took a lot out of my heart. And then so it's like kind of hard to explain with love, man, because love can't truly be defined. Well, I can see that love in your mom reflected in you, from, you know, I, um... I can see it reflected in everything you do. I'm, I'm, I told you before many times I'm amazed at you. You know, I, I, uh, I was talking to someone last night. So last night we had our, we had a study group together and we went in and we, we worked with the unhoused. I got to say the unhoused, the right word. Um, and, uh, you know, the woman who was helping there, she said, well, I, you know, she went through a lot of times where she didn't have. And I said, I've never been in my life any time where I didn't have, I, I wasn't raised rich but I always had enough. There was a time in my life where I was probably qualified as pretty poor, but uh, I always had enough. I never lacked my whole life. And, and so I think that, you know, you've been through a lot 
and yet you've carried that love. It's easy to carry love of God when you've got a roof over your head, you've, you've got no one coming down and arresting you and torturing you. Um, I'm going to say something about that, or uh, maybe a question I have. How many of the people that were tortured by, it was John Birch who tortured you, right? And yes, his, how many, how many people you tortured look like me? And I'm not uh, being tall. I don't, uh, I don't have any record of John Birch's torch in any um, Caucasian uh, suspects. Right. You know, my point is to those people who say that this, you know, that this world is a fair world or that, you know, racism is a thing of the past. We don't have slavery anymore. My family never owned slaves. I've heard a lot of things like that. Well, that's okay. And my family didn't own slaves. But that doesn't mean that stuff isn't happening to James or people like James even to this very day. Because George Floyd didn't happen 30 years ago. George Floyd happened last year. And it wasn't just Flo George Floyd. It's Ahmaud Ar 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 Arbery. A lot of people. It's happening, it's happening every day in, in little subtle ways. And James, I'm sure it's still happening to you. When you walk down the street, do you get the same reactions I get? Today. When I uh, when I walk down the street, um, I don't think I, I don't think you get the same reactions that I get. You know what I mean? I think it's I, I, the, color, I, the color of my skin. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we still stuck in the moment uh, where we shouldn't be. You know that's right. that's you know that's that's why I get so confused. You know, for 30 years, um, I uh, I didn't watch TV. I don't watch TV now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, I know that's kind of hard for people to believe because I'm all over the internet and all over the news media. But I, I didn't watch TV. I missed all of the, the Bulls era. I missed all of the uh, Michael Jordan and all and, 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 and the Bears and all that stuff because I, I wrote 10,000 letters to the nation. And the reason I was writing to the nation is because I was talking to myself because I didn't have nobody to talk to. But I wrote those letters out of love. I wrote those letters because I, my mother, every time she saw me, she kept saying, love. She said, you got to get that out your heart. And I used to tell her, what you mean get it out of my heart? I ain't do nothing. I don't got to get nothing out of my heart. And she was saying, baby, in order for the Lord to do what he need to do for you, you got to get that out your heart in order to be focused and prepare yourself what you need to, what you need to go through. And she told me this. She said, you're going to do about 20 years or so. She said, because they ain't playing fair. They ain't going to play fair. She said, so, but you got to get that out your heart. She said, that's the only way that you can make a change. She said, for far too long, we've been, we've been getting the same message. Every 500 years, somebody had stood in, the, stood in the gap and said, man, first love your creator and then installing you and enabling you to love others. And we in all this mess that we in right now today, at the same time, this whole planet, things are coming from the sky. People are falling dead. Sickness, are, kids are turning against their families. We, we, I can't even tell you that I'm sorry right now to this day. Let me tell you a story. A couple of weeks ago, I was riding in my car. I went around to my old mother's neighborhood. My advisors be advising me, don't go into the city of Chicago, the south side, the west side of Chicago because of A, Y, and Z. But I went over there anyway because I, I don't got no enemies. You know what I'm saying? I love everybody. You know what I'm saying? And I ain't even caught up in the middle of all this turmoil that's going on because I believe that God is still in control. So when I pulled up on the middle of the block to the structure that I wanted to take the picture of, I didn't, rec I didn't, I didn't dawn on me that it was seven young men to my right, you know, because I got out on the driver's side and I took the picture of the structure and went, and I stopped in the middle of the block. So when I turned to the right and I, and I noticed that I had stopped in the middle of the block, the three, the seven gentlemen, they said, um, excuse me, um, you shopping? And I said, um, no, I ain't shopping. I knew what shopping meant, you know, I'm from the land. I know the, the land. I said, no, I ain't shopping my brother. I'm so sorry, I don't mean no disrespect. And I noticed that they had a chair, a couch, and a table in the middle of the block. And so I walked up to them because I was trying to take back control of the situation because they, they, they was looking real aggressive, you know what I'm saying? And so I, and they had caught me off balance and I didn't want to show that I was scared, you know what I'm saying? Because fear can, can, can cause more fear, you know what I'm saying? So when I walked up to them, I immediately took control of the conversation and I, and I looked at all their faces. I had never met any of those seven gentlemen in my life. And I was able to identify four of them by the bone structures of their DNA. So I, I started calling out their great grandmothers and their great grandfather's name when I looked at the, the, the young man. And I said, are you related to A, Y, and Z? And he said, well, yeah. I said, that's your grandmother yet? And so they said, man, uh, 
Uh, if you need anything, man, you can just come on back around it. So I said, no, young man. So I gave him a, 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 a plugger with my face on it saying, I'm James Giffen. You know what I'm saying? And I was taken from this land. And, and so uh, I don't mean to be no disrespectful. And I got in my car and I rolled away. And so when I felt that I was safe enough and secure enough, I cried. And you know why I cried? Because like I said, I ain't been in tune to what's going on in the talk show realm, in the Hollywood realm. I've been in tune with what God been talking about and what he's been telling me. I cried because the same things are taking place 30 years later and there's no change. There's no love. There's no empathy. There's no compassion. And this is not a black issue. This is not a white issue. This is not a Puerto Rican issue. This is not a Mexican issue. This is a human issue. It's so simple as wash your hands. It's so simple as respect your elders. It's so simple as if you don't work for nothing, you ain't gonna get nothing. It's so simple, but yet still, we still talking about the same topic. And now we talking about James Giffen one, James Giffen two, and James Giffen three. And so I'm standing on the land tonight and my heart is still sad, even though it's, it's, it's a, it should be a moment for me in which I have came out and which I came out and what I came through. You know, I floated in toilet water in Manar. I floated in the pits. I've been in Pontiac. I've been in Stateville. I've been in Jolly. I've been in all of the maximum security penitentiaries. But yet I stayed humble and, and I stayed respectful. And I stayed, I stayed with my principles. I stayed with my values. I stayed with respect to somebody. I didn't care what color skin you were. If you came to me, you could call any prison in Illinois and ask them and say, they call me many names. I forgot to tell you, they also call me Peter Gunn too. With my James Grant consultant, James Grant publisher, James Grant entertainment, CMOF, and all those other things that I do. I go by many names and you can ask any one of them. They'll tell you the same. I sat at the table with love. I didn't discriminate. I don't understand why we in this day in 2021 going into 2022 that we have not came to grips with. It's so simple. And the, and the, and the thing with it with me is and why I'm so sad. And they say he, he talk like he angry all the time when he when he's talking to the people. No, I'm not talking to people angry. I'm talking to the people because the knowledge is pain and pain is knowledge when you already know from a child. And we still ain't figured this out. And now we dying. The planet is in a moment of dying at the same time, and we still ain't figured this out. It's okay if you want to live over there. It's okay if you want to stay down there. It's okay, but we still can have some empathy, some principles, some morals, some values. Like in my situation, I don't. I think that this is the. You know, I got a. I got a text from somebody, and they asked me. They asked me, "Why you wear a flag on your on your on your shirt every time we see you on the news? And why are you always saying that you that this is the greatest country?" On Earth from sea to sign and sea, and and then I, and then I, and then I and then I gave him I gave him that, and I said, you know why I say this is the greatest country on Earth? Not only financially and physically and mentally, I had to break it down that we're not landfill, and that from sea to sign and sea we control the seaports and the airways that make us the greatest country. But that when I found this laid down the Constitution, a due process and equal protection of law. Make no mistake about it, it wasn't written for us because we ain't French. It was written for them, but it was written for the people that there would never be a day in the country foundation and history of the constitution where there would be one party controlling. And so when due process and protection came in law and I, and I passed the constitution and I saw a show Perry Mason and I realized that I had a right to, my, to be confronted by accused of my dead court, that's when I knew that no matter what barriers they place against me, my color, my skin, because my mother told me so, no matter what they say about me, the constitution in this country make us the greatest nation on earth from sea to shiny sea because we have due process and equal protection of law. And so that's one of the things that have fascinated me about when I realized my constitution and my rights as a United States citizen and that I realized that before me and after me, that you know, I, I got to do what I had to do. And so that's why I, I, I rolled through the system like I rolled through with no hatred, no jealousy, no envy, no malice. You know what I'm saying? I showed empathy, compassion. You know what I'm saying? I didn't care about all that stuff because I love people, man, because my mama loved people and she couldn't even hear what y'all was talking about. But then still, she loved everything. James, let me, let me ask you a question. And this is a question that is for me too. And we've got a lot of kids here. 
how can we change the system so we don't have these inequities, these terrible and what, what are some some concrete things we can do to change the system? Because you know, this is our future. We got a lot of kids on this call. How can and, and by the way, I want to I want to work side by side with them. You you've seen things that none of us have seen, or many of us on this call haven't seen. Um, what are some concrete actions we can do to help make the world a better place? So the next James Gibson, 30 years from now, or even a year from now, is is not getting arrested, tortured. That, that we, we, we can stop these inequities, which hurt all of us. That's a good question. And uh, I would like to say to the public that right now, uh, we have uh, the votes in the Senate and the Congress. We also have the Vice President and President of the United States. In Illinois, we have the Governor and the State's Attorney that's on board with this prison mission and truth uh, and sentence and, and reform. And so for the grassroots organizations and the young kids out there, because uh, that's how we started 30 years ago with the young people. The young people had sparked a fire in their heart. And so what we used to do is we used to have classes where we used to sit down and we used to draw abstracts to our legislators in our different districts. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's, it's a different thing when we talk about what we want to do, but when we put it on paper. So like, say, for example, if you want to if you want to stop somebody from driving down your block at excessive speed, you go get you a stop sign and you build and you put it there. And then you, or you go get you some speed breakers to stop them from running through that. And so therefore they're breaking the law. So what I'm saying is this, across the nation, we're pushing at all 52 states on this qualified immunity. We, we filed uh, amicus briefs and actually that th they take back this qualified immunity on all these unjustified shootings because the reason they're able to get away with these shootings across America is because in their policies and their training, it states that if an officer perceive a thought in his mind, he can shoot you. And so a lot of people don't know the policy, Steve. And so like in this police shooting, in a police shooting, when a police shoot somebody, he don't go back to the police station. He goes back to his home. And then he goes to a lockbox and he pulls out a category, he pulls out this, this book and it tells him what to put in his report. And, then, and when he reading in this report, it tells him that if you perceive a thought in your mind, if you say that in this report, that this is justifiable shoot. We are in a position right now in history where the whole world is listening, we got the momentum. All the grassroots organizations, if we start drafting up legislation in each one of our districts and each one of these states saying that, look, we want these um, uh, 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 juvenile sentences uh, 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 redacted. You know what I'm saying? We want this uh, uh, line of identification uh, uh, redone. Because like in line of identification is what we did in Illinois. We're not, we, we're, yes, in Illinois, Barack Obama, the former uh, president of the United States, when he was a senator, he passed into legislation with the grassroots organization where if, uh, uh, if a, a suspect goes into a police station, it automatically a camera comes on and it, it, it records what's going on and if it's a murder. You know about that? These are grassroots organizations like myself. Um, I started back long ago and I started petitioning the legislators, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the attorney general, this attorney general states of Illinois right now. Uh, he was a representative back then and we did Legislations, and we I passed into law the 775, the Illinois Control Statute Torture Human Act here in Illinois. So we have to get together all across these different states, come come like, like especially around the Mason Dixon line and them Jim Crow states. You know, what I'm saying where they where they've been holding these policies for hundreds of years. You know, policies not on don't only apply to wrongful convictions. See, they they apply to the housing. They apply to education, they, they apply to medication, they apply to transportation, but right now we're talking about this prison reform. So what we do is we go into their statutes because each state has its own statute. You know what I'm saying? Each state has their own post-conviction. Each state has their own state habeas corpus, but all states have a federal habeas corpus. And one of the things that's keeping us down in the United States on the federal habeas corpus is when former President uh, uh, Clinton was the president and was Hillary Clinton lost the president when she ran and people brought up against Trump is that when he was the president, he signed the anti-terrorist bill, which abolished the, uh, the federal habeas corpus for state prisoners, where it's called and put into play a tolling time. So if we, can, if we can get people in all these states to come together and we drop an abstract acting the President Biden to rescind the, the anti-terrorist 1996 Bill, not the whole bill, because it protects the homeland security and all that other stuff, but it's a piece of pork in there that affects the federal habeas corpus. And I, in our individual states, like we did in Illinois, starting in January the 1st, 
This legislature and the General Assembly, the governor had already signed into law saying that if a guy been in prison over 20 years and it's a black issue, they going into the statute and saying, man, we're going to reconsider sentencing this guy if he has if he has an institutional adjustment. The state's attorney here, Kim Fox, the honorable state's attorney, Kim Fox, she has agreed to this. So in Illinois, we didn't already push you know, this legislation from when we abolished the death penalty. I said with the death row 10, when we about we brought the torture center on the land. So we have to come together and we have to look into our status, our statutes in these different states, and then we formulate these plans to attack that and take these policies out of play. Thank you, James. I've got a question from Goldfred. Uh, Goldfred, can you unmute yourself? And maybe if you want to show your video, that'd be great. Yes, I'm, I'm alive. Yes, you are. All uh, right. Okay. I, I listened to James' expose is, is very touching tonight. I, where I am is 2 o'clock a.m. in Liberia. And I got recommendation for him. Uh, he, he spoke about love and it's so much touching that love is a scrap that you cannot see, but you can feel it. So my recommendation to James and the whole world is that love and peace should be taught in every elementary schools up to university level as a course by itself and have a professor for it then we can see the world going to another transition because love is something that once him or her love for anyone, the world is definitely going to be a better place because I have a local NGO in Liberia where I deal with more than 350 children. What the most central thing we are teaching them is love. And once they grab that mindset of love, definitely I can tell you for free, the world going to be a very better place. I stop well, there for, thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. Go for it, I put a comment in earlier, I'm just gonna read it. And I think it's almost exactly what you said and you'll probably know where it's from. Ultimately, the power to transform the world is affected by love. Love originating from the relationship with the divine, love of blaze among members of a community, love extended, and this is the part I really love, love extended without restriction to every human being. Do you know where that's from? Any, no, any, no. That's from the, I don't know if you've ever read this. Are you, are you a Baha'i? Yes, I am a Baha'i. July 22nd, 2020 letter from the House of Justice. Okay, I think I'm going to follow up. I'm going to yeah, so you know what you may not have seen it is because it was to the Baha'is of America. So you might not have seen it, but it's a really beautiful letter. Okay, okay, okay. I posted it because actually I was listening to James and he inspired me. So James, I'll, I think I've sent you that letter before. I think you've read it. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. It was a beautiful letter. But this, I want to see it. What you've been talking about is laws, and I just want to add on to that. I agree with you. But I want to add one other thing, and that is that we have to change our hearts and that I have to see you, Gulfred, everyone as my brother and vice versa. You cannot treat your brother the way you were treated. If, if Mr. Burge or the people who do those types of things saw you as their brother, they truly saw you as fully human. They couldn't have done what they did to you. We need to, and then to Gulfred's point, we need to train that at a very early age. We need to pull that hate out of people's hearts and put it and put love in there. And we have to have just laws as well. What, what do you think? We were talking about that last night, remember? We were talking about that last night at um, Inglewood Bobby event. Uh, uh, but the thing of it is this, right? Uh, um, we've been talking about love since the beginning of creation. And we still ain't loving. You know, uh, uh, I believe, uh, I don't want to scare anybody, but I believe that we're in that time that it was written in the books. You know what I mean? I believe also that God is still in control. I believe that he's sending a message that it's not too late. I believe that until our people turn from their ways, then will he heal our land and then hear our call. I believe that right now, 
humanly that I must, my mission is to implement policies. You know, um, if I would have implemented policies, um, the city of Chicago would have got the Olympic bid. You know what I'm saying? Do you know I'm, I'm the reason why the city of Chicago didn't get the Olympic bid? Because I was putting policies down through Playboy magazine, Hugh Hefner and them, and, and Candy Cane Entertainment, and, and I was doing blog talk live, and I was putting pressure on them. I was changing laws where they wrote into law the Illinois Torture Human Act, 775. And so it, 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 it's, it's about love. It was wrote into law by love. But love right now, I believe, uh, ain't going to get us out of this mess because it's just too much mess. And it's too much hate. It's more hating than this love. Love in the end going to prevail. Because love is more powerful than death as I started this conversation off. But me being in love didn't get me where I'm sitting at today. I had to lay down policies. I had to constantly write policy. I've been to the pellet court myself. I've talked to about the 30,000 stuff that I did, but I didn't talk about myself. I filed 27 appeals myself. It had nothing to do with no love. It had to do with status. It had to do with tone and time, rest to the college, procedure bar, collateral, and stop me. The people weren't talking about no empathy. I had went to the pellet court eight times and lost before they reversed me, and I had no dissension for the first time in this country history in 300 years. But love didn't get that motion, my, my motion in court. Love would have been sending us to the penitentiary and to the graveyard. Love been tricking us with all these dope that they taking and all these pills they popping. Love has been tricking us with all this reality stuff they showing on TV, everybody cutting the rug and shaking it up while we laying up here, stuff falling out the sky, we looking at the phone. Love ain't gonna get this change. What's gonna get this change is I love to put this pen because the pen is more powerful than the sword. And with our love, we can change history. Just like our founders when they wrote the due process law and equal protection law that every citizen of the United States has the right to the Constitution to access the court, cruel and unusual punishment. And then after we get through writing it with love, we can put some more love on it by filing it into our legislators and our senators while we got the president of the United States and the country all disembodied. Well, you just made a point, and I, and, and I agree with, and that is, and I think this is what you're saying, but let me clarify make sure I got it right. I'm about to post something. You've heard me say this before. The best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me. Neglect it not that I may confide in thee. And you just can't have love and say, I love you, James. You got to show that love. And if my if I say I love you and I am prejudiced, if I say I, if I if I if I do racist acts, if I do, if I if I if we don't have equity for all our citizens, that's not love. Anyway, but you got to have just laws. You got to have fair laws. You got to have. You can't just say you love someone. They have. We have to have justice and equity and fairness for all people. That's love. It's not just love. Just saying the word love. What you're talking about, I think, is that we're saying love, but we're not doing love. So let love me, go ahead. If, I, if let me just try to interject it like this, then we got to have some tough love. Yes. We gotta have Absolutely. some tough love. We gotta have some tough love because we keep on telling you the same thing over and over and over again. Just like um, I was telling a uh, um, uh, Fred Hampton when I was in the um, the um, the I'm so honored to sit at the table with Fred Hampton, man, I, and his and and the the job his mother doing it and him, you know. But I asked him a question about why is it, why we still talking the same stuff after 30 years and why they hate us so much and why why people hate so much. You know what I'm saying? They still hate right now. You know what I'm saying? It's just that it's just that it's just that it's on a, it's on levels of hate. It's levels of love. But in the end, love always prevails. If if I would have had hate in my heart, right? I would have never been able to get the knowledge and the information that I needed to accomplish the job and the task to prove myself innocent by myself. If I would have, if I'd have had hatred, I was in the cells. I told you, I've been in the cells with guys three, four hundred pounds, and they on the top bunk, and I'm on the bottom bunk with 135 with pure love. And every time they went to talking that mumbo jumbo stuff, I just tell them, man, I love you, man. That's all. And if we had to knuckle up after that, we had to knuckle up. And then if I got my lip busted after that, I got my lip busted, but I lived to see another day because it was in love. 
But I'm just saying, Father, Father, changing what's happening right now. People are tired of talking about what you got and what you can do and what you've been through and what you've seen. They want to see some examples by leading into love. They want to see some change. People dying while we talking. We done lost three folks. I was just on the news a couple of weeks out there in Rolling Meadows. I was highlighting the case, Ronald Kleiner. The guy, I put him on the phone with the national media. Do you know how excited he must have been to been inside a prison? Talking to James Gibson on the land, to the national media, while, while James Gibson standing with his dying mother with stage four counsel. And then three days later, they called me talking about he hung in a cell. He did. So, so, so I'm saying, so I'm saying love. Yeah, we got to give them some hard love. You know what I'm saying? I, since I've been out, I done got eight brothers out on clemency and pardons. And I got 16 cases in the county jail on the court call, like I said right now. I'm James Gibson one, I'm James Gibson two, I'm James Gibson three, because the court says so. So like, just like if you were in a movie and you hear that song, uh, uh, don't, don't. And people versus Gibson one, don't, don't. And people versus Gibson two, don't, don't. And people versus Gibson three. They got a roadmap, they got a path on how to deal with these cases on generalizations and specifics in these cases like that. These John Burgess cases, Guevara cases, the um, Watts cases, and all these other atrocities. We got the ladies' policies down on them with love, and we got to start changing the way they police us with love, and we got to put the eye on them like they got all these speed camera bumps, speed camera traps. We got to start putting speed camera traps in the courtroom. So, because I realized something, just like with slavery 300 years ago, the only way the United States abolished the slavery here, because everybody else outside was talking about it. And when people start talking about your dirty laundry and your mess, you try to put up this curtain and make it look like your mess ain't, is all, all good, but all mess stink. So when you come to me talking about let's do some marching and some rallies, I'm not doing no more marching. I ain't doing no more rallies. I'm putting that pin with this love. I'm changing these policies and I'm gonna make sure that this don't happen again. Now it's gonna cost them. Make no mistake about it, it's gonna cost them. But I'm gonna put this pin on them with love and I'm gonna change these policies so they will not be another Jesse Hatch. You know what I'm saying? We just lost Jesse Hatch, a brother in jail. We just lost uh, a whole bunch of other brothers. My mind has got these names everywhere, but we losing people and we run out of time. So I would advise my young people with the passion, with bullying. Don't be subjected to bullying with, with trying to fit in. Don't be subjected with trying to fit in, with, with trying to be up with the latest fashion. Don't be subjected. You know what? I don't even drink or use drugs. When I was, when I was a young teenager, that wasn't my thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking to my young people now. I want you to know that it's okay to be all right. It's okay to be different. It's okay to look different. It's okay to talk different. It's okay to have rings around your eyes. It's okay to have a gap in your teeth. It's okay to have dreadlock. It's okay to have freckles. It's okay to have your hair cut short. It's okay to dye your hair yellow, pink, yellow. It's okay to listen to Led Zeppelin, Ted Nugent, and Van Halen. It's okay to listen to Drake and Dirk and all that stuff, but put it in proper contents and love somebody. It's okay to be LGBT. It's okay. By the way, you know, Debbie just put something there, and I just want to say it's exactly what I was trying to say, but much more succinct. It's from the Baha'i Writings. Let deeds, not words, be your adorning. It's what you've been saying. Let deeds, not words. So you know what? Stop saying you love me. Show me, right? That's what Let me saying. tell you. You know what? My mama, right? Uh, she bless her heart. My mama. I love my mama. I love my mama to the day my eyes close. I love my mama. You know, uh, uh. You know, she used to say, um, uh, 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 bring me my flowers so I can smell them. Because when I'm gone, I ain't gonna be able to smell them. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, she, she also told me that that when you when you love somebody, you do the things that a person that does that love somebody does. It's just natural, it comes natural. I don't have to tell you I love you. My actions gonna show you that I love you. Like if I just get up. And help and put and rub your feet or, or get up and hold your hand. I mean, I'm gonna do the things natural. I hold the door. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a natural, it's an etiquette. It's like an etiquette. It's an etiquette, it's so simple. When your mama, your mama gave you the first love when she put you in her arms and she cradled you. You know what I'm saying? That was the first sign human contact of love. 
know what I'm saying? It's so simple. Why, why we can't just like to, like today with all this, this uh uh this this evilness out here in the mess, you know, uh 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 even today, you know, I'm James Gibson on that, but I don't I don't go around certain places, you know, because I don't I don't I don't that don't excite me, you know what I'm saying? Plus, I I don't I don't I don't see that's cool if I gotta go to your place and I gotta turn up a bottle. That make me cool. I got to go to your place. I got to put something in my mouth. That make me cool. I got to go to your place. I got to pop something out. That make me cool. If that make me cool, then I can't go to the place. So I don't go to a lot of places. So they say, they say I'm strange. I'm odd. I'm the, I'm the designated driver, so to speak. So I'm saying it's okay if you don't drink. It's okay if you don't want to smoke no dope. It's okay if, if, if you don't want to pop no pill. You know what I'm saying? I don't make you square. It's okay to be square. It's okay to be cool. It's okay to have knowledge. It's okay to read books. It's okay to pray. You can still pray and be swagged out. There are times you see James, this is for my young people, because my young people, they love me these days. They be saying, man, you swagged out. I'm 55 years old. To God be the glory, I just turned 55. Speed limit. I can drive 55. I'm on the land. I'm on the land. When they see me, they're like, man, you be swagged out. You know, it's okay to be swagged out and still love, but I love you. It's okay. Man, you had on this, you was over, you was over there. It's okay. I ain't trying to fit in. I just want to love you. And I'm going to give you this pain because pain is knowledge and knowledge is pain. And when I give you this knowledge and when I give you this pain, whether it's through music, whether it's through art, whether it's through entertainment, whether it's through CMOS, whether it's through consulting, whether it's through publishing, whether it's through entertainment, whether it's through pop-up shows, whether it's through events, whether it's through gallery, whether it's through film, whether it's through me writing, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to tell you to give it to somebody else in order to keep it. If you go and ask anybody that ever sat and met me, they're going to tell you the same thing. When I start with you, I'm going to tell you, just be truthful. You don't have to lie to me to kick it. Could be straight direct with me and tell me what's on your mind. It's all right. We can agree to disagree. And I'm not going to disrespect you or do anything to cross that line because I love you. Because when I love you, I'm going to carry myself in a way that shows you that I love everything around me. And when somebody else ain't on that page, I'm going to make sure they ain't around me. When they see me, why do you think you see me with the Rainbow Coalition flavor? And I ain't talking about Operation Push or Jesse Jackson. I'm talking about when you see James Gibson on the land, James Gibson on the land. You're going to see the bell. You're going to see Moon. You're going to see my nephew. You're going to see all these flavors because we're on the land with love. So it's okay to be uh, different. It's okay to be LGBT. It's okay to like who you like. You know what I'm saying? It's okay that you look funny. I look funny too. It's okay that people laugh at you and talk about you. That don't change who you are as a person. For the young people, y'all are the future. Y'all are the one that lit the fire on the George Floyd, on the George Floyd indictment. Y'all are the ones that standing on the biggest settlement in the history of this country without even filing a deposition or being deposed in the case because the young people across America are tired of this discrimination and separation. They're tired of when they come home and they house them and their mothers telling them don't like him and they ask their mother, why mama? Why I don't want why I don't want to like him? And they tired of people giving them misinformation. And so they dig it and they dig it into the books and they pray it and they pray it to their God and they get the message and it has sparked the fire across this nation like never before it's from sea to shiny sea the young people james i i don't i think it's time to open it up because i have a feeling we had a lot of questions so first of all james as usual i could just listen to you all night and but i i, I gotta i gotta in the interest of time debbie's gonna yell at me if i if i don't keep it to time thank you so just from the bottom of my heart thank you for for blessing all of us including me with your presence um i've got a question from Golfred, but before we go to Golfred, let's see if anyone else has a question because we've already had one from Golfred. Uh, let me see if there's any any questions in chat or if anyone wants, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Or just uh, unmute yourself, show your video. Um, James, I actually have one question for you. So I know that you mentioned um, earlier about George Floyd, about George Floyd, I mean, and of course, you're very right that this issue definitely continues to happen to this day. How do you think we can work to change this? How do you think we, like, as the youth can work to change this? Or do I you think, think that change will ever come? I think that, I think that the, youth, the youth right now uh, 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 have the most power in their hands that they ever had since the 60s. Since the 60s. I think that you can be, it can be changed by simply uh, writing legislation 
and demanding that your uh, uh, your leaders and your communities uh, 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 put you at the seat at the table with them as the voting power block that y'all have. See, y'all came out the woodworks in this last election with this Biden election thing and the Donald Trump thing. And y'all came out the woodworks in the Obama election. The young people are the ones that's pushing the, uh, the agenda, so to speak, across America. You see what I'm saying? Because y'all the hidden weapon. Y'all more smarter and more faster and more quicker than, than we were 30 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Fast technology. And y'all got more uh, uh, connections with assets, assets, stem, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? So y'all, y'all right now, y'all, y'all, y'all can y'all can gather quickly. And what I mean by quickly is start drawing up these simple letters. They say, man, listen, and your and so you go to a post eviction in your state, right? And you see that um um, um it says that um, for example, um, um to meet a gist of a constitutional claim to get past procedure bar, uh, a total time. You can ask that your legislators legislators in that state. You know, read, read that, that, or amend that part of the statute to give people a, a, a better playing field. Now, let me say this to you, young man. I believe that if you commit a crime, you should go to jail. I believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. But I also believe that this country is not fair and it's constitutional in applying this justice. Fairly. You know what I'm saying? There's no balance. You know what I'm saying? And so I believe that it, uh, the, the rich people get a pass and the poor people don't. I believe that if you got lawyers, you might get some help and, 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 and other people don't. But so I'm saying the young people, y'all right now in a position like yourself, you got the people listening to you. You know what I'm saying? The young people, they listen to you. And so you can start having little small groups with them and y'all can start researching that, that statute and that, <clears throat> and that language and you can change that language. And once you corner your legislators and your elected officials and you demand this by putting it in their hand, don't write nothing. Don't call nothing because a lot of times when you make phone calls to people in position, it goes to their assistants. You know what I'm saying? It goes to the people that handle it. And then just like uh, the uh, 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 this talk show, when you write talk show, the, the host don't never get them letters. But if you catch that host and you corner them with that petition, like if you catch them letters, Trace, you catch them and you put that document, that document in their hand, it's got to be called up. And so once it's put on docket, that's when you make the movement. And then once this docket, then you bring all your, your, your support behind it and y'all make an appearance saying we stand in, in, in regards of this A, Y, and Z if it ain't nothing but a stop sign. You know what I'm saying? Or if it's somebody in your neighborhood that you don't want there or somebody, you know what I'm saying? It's, you can implement your own. That's how laws have changed. That's how I became president. James, James. listen, three. James, we got a question here. Um, actually, um, let me go to Goldfred's question first because he's had his hand up for a while. Goldfred, let's see. Right, plus it's two a.m. There, you got to respect that—that that you're up at two a.m. and listening. Um, can you unmute? Great. Hi, James. I I am very thought by you tonight, and I'm grateful to be on the platform tonight. I I want to ask you a question. When you were in prison and you show a lot of love to your fellow friends in prison, were they moved by those love? Well, let me tell you, uh, uh, I was in Miami a couple of weeks, a couple of days ago, and I got a phone call from uh, the prison uh, down in Stateville. I've been out in five more months, it'd be three years. And the whole prison system starts singing when it's cold outside. And so um, um, I, I get phone calls right now today from all of the prisons. And 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 so I believe that I that I've that I've changed, but I also got a phone call and and, and the warden down there asked me, what do I think will be the state of the prison now that I'm gone and there's nobody else to teach lessons? So that's like a a hard question to ask, but the people that, if you could contact that know me or that I'm working with or that I've worked around or been around me, I'm the same flavor. I'm the same, I got the same spirit. I got the same, whatever you want to call it, I'm consistent. You know, I'm consistent like right now, I'll be telling my friend Steve, you got to take that turmeric. I'm consistent, I take that every day. Consistent is my life depend on. I'm consistent. Whatever I do, I'm consistent. I don't know how they're dealing with it now because right now in the state of Illinois, uh, uh, there's a big scandal going on. 
and a lot of inmates are ODing and dying, and so they're trying to hide it from the news. So they're moving up hundreds of inmates around from Stateville, Pontiac, Menard, and all this stuff that just you know to cover their tracks. But far, when they get through pack unpacking, they're gonna know James Gibson on the land, and they're gonna be reaching out to James Gibson, and you can and they're gonna tell them the same thing, man. The, the it's shifted a little bit far as how people feel. But yes, uh, I left a dent. All right. Uh, another uh, another one is it's not a question is just from this conversation tonight and from this platform I have learned a lot and I will decide in my community to have a peace club with a lot of young people because what I'm learning on this platform is very touching. I'm going to gather a lot of young people to have a peace club with them to teach them some things about love and peace so it's not going to go free i'm grateful that i'm on the platform tonight thank you thank you thank you thank you um james i got a question uh let me see if i get the name right uh this is from lawrence um lawrence says i did not know anything going into this but after hearing you what you said it made him open his eyes and, and made him want to take action he said you were it was an honor to hear your words and his question is what was your dad doing when you were in jail well let me tell you what my dad was doing my dad had this on me when uh when i got arrested falsely arrested and, uh, uh, and this case has split my family in half uh, uh, a lot of my family members are law enforcement, law enforcement agencies and, and all that other stuff, work for the government and all that stuff. So uh, it's just like you, before you heard about the tragedy, you believe everything you see. And so uh, my father had disowned me when uh, I got arrested. You know what I'm saying? He was like, oh, I, I, I can't go to work. My son, I'm already blocking you. You got a murder. Oh my God, I might lose my job. Oh. And so he, he disowned me. So we didn't have no communications. And I don't even know when he died to this day. I'm sorry, but the truth is the truth. Um, any other questions? We've been going on. Believe it or not, James, we're at an hour. It feels like it's been five minutes. Why don't we go with one final question? So I told Debbie I'd try to keep it to about 45 minutes. And we're already we're already pushing an hour, which is amazing to me, James, because it feels like we just started. I've got to tell you, like I said, I could listen to you forever. I've got a question from Sarvanos. Um, so I read an article about you, and you told that you had a girlfriend before you were arrested who was pregnant. What happened to your girlfriend and your baby now? Uh, I don't know what happened to the baby, right? And uh, uh the girl. The girl that I had uh, got pregnant, uh, she, 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 she ran off into the military. And uh, her family, just like my dad, they're like, oh, he got a murder. You can't be talking to no convicted killer and all that. And, and they ran off and I never seen my daughter. I have not seen my daughter to this day. It's been, uh, I think, 34 years, 35 years. I still ain't met my daughter. That's her loss, James. But uh, I have a feeling that may change. I certainly hope for her sake it does because she's lucky to have a father like her. And uh, I hope that she knows that someday. Some level, maybe. Um, we we're about out of time. I just want to tell you, I've just been reading the comments and, and so many people are thankful. So um, just want to say thank you again on behalf of not just me, but everyone here. And you've got a ton of really happy people here tonight. I think you've inspired people. And what I want to say to people is, you know, James is an inspiration to me to try and do more, to try and do more. And I have the platform, someone who's given, been given a lot of privilege to do more. And I'm going to do everything I can. And James knows this to try and make a world that's more fair. I don't want to live in a world where someone like James, someone who's so smart and so talented and has so much to give the world is thrown into prison for a crime he didn't commit. And I don't want to live in that world and I want to fight for a world where that doesn't happen. 
And so, James, thank you so much for gracing us with your, your wisdom and your experience tonight. I think I can not only think, I know, because we're filling up with the chat with the comments. You inspired a bunch of people tonight with comments like, thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. You've inspired me more than I thought possible tonight. That's pretty much like all the comments. So I just want to say, uh, you know what? Thank you for, for helping a lot of kids out tonight. And there's going to be a lot more. We're going to watch this. We're going to have peace because the whole, this whole podcast is about peace by having justice. And I appreciate that you've come out of such injustice and that you're fighting for justice. You could have come out a lot angrier. You could have come out a lot more to take revenge and you didn't, you came out for justice. You said, like you said, tough love, but that tough love is for justice. That tough love is for, so people don't have to deal with what you had to deal with. So thank you so much, James. Uh, Devin, do you have anything to add before we close off? Uh, I mean, like Steve said, thank you so much, James. I've definitely learned a lot from you. And it was really an honor to hear from you tonight. I'm looking forward to meeting you, young man, and we going to the next level because knowledge is pain and pain is knowledge. And anytime you need to reach out to me, you can call me personally. My phone number is 708-295-7159. It ain't going to change. Devin, you got you got to meet James. You, James and Devin, you got to meet in person. We got to we got to set that up next time you're in Chicago. I I just can't wait to see that. You're gonna have you're gonna have a new mentor. Yeah, James, I'll reach out to you. I'm gonna be reaching out to you. Yes, sir. And and you be well, young man. Like I said, my phone number is always the same. <laughs> well, I uh, I'm inspired. I thank you all. And 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 the last thing I'll leave you with is let's everyone be working together. Something you, you really, you said early on, James, when you're talking to the prison, you say you didn't care what anyone looked like. You told me last night people had swastikas. You didn't care. You know, they're, they're people first. I wish everyone thought like that. I mean, I wish that, that nobody ever got treated badly because of the color of their skin or their gender. Let's all of us work together for a world like that. Let's let's start working one person at a time to turn on the, turn on, as Queen Bay just said, peace and light. Oh, All excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Oh my God, you said Queen Bay? I did say Queen Bay. That's my cousin. That's my cousin. Oh my God, she was she was what she was with me. She been with me for twenty five years. She never missed a a meal. Oh my God, okay, Queen, that's my cousin. <laughs> Queen Bay. <laughs> well, I've been. Wow. Thomas, I can see she's related to you. So Queen Bay, thank you for your light. Everyone, turn on your lights, turn on your peace, turn on your love, but don't just turn on love in name, turn it on in deeds. And I hope this talk tonight inspired you to fight for justice and to help James in his, in his quest to have a more just world where everyone, everyone gets fair shake, where no one gets put in prison for a crime they didn't commit where everyone gets treated like a full human being. Anything to, anything to add to that, James? I want to say that love your creator and he instilled in you to be able to love others. And you don't have to read that out of book. Nobody have to tell you that. Love your creator, love yourself. Love yourself and you can love others. If you can love yourself, you're going to love others. You're not going to be able to see colors. Because just look at this, if you take a black kid and a white kid and you put them in a room and you raise them up and you never mention anything about colors, they never talk about no black and white, it's gonna be love. Cause we've been together, we've been taking each other, picking each other up off the, off the floor because we've been in a room together. So love yourself first and then you can love others. And stop mm -hmm. all that backbiting, stop all that backbiting. You know, stop all that backbiting. If something on your heart, tell people how you feel, but you can tell people how you feel in a respectful way. It's okay to say, I'm sorry. And, it, you know, when you look, when you talk about loving your creator, who created us all? The same creator. And, and when I, by the way, I just shared your email, James. Since you shared your phone number, I figure it's okay to share your email. Is that all right? It's all right. It's all right. Um, but they, um, that's, that's, that's for golf, right? Am I saying that right? Hey, golf, right? Yes. I, yes. I, 
I think I I got James email. So when when I look at you, James, I have to look you in the eyes, and I got to see that Creator coming, reflected in in that beautiful soul. We have to stop looking at people. Um, Abdul Baha said, "Look at the color of everyone's heart, not their skin." What he's talking about is we look at them soul first, and all of our souls reflect our Creator. It's crazy we're looking at outside things. We got to look at those souls. And, and we have to really push it to do that, to, to really get away from all this, the poison that society is putting in, in us, to look at you as anything less than fully human, to look at anyone as, as less than fully human is wrong. And so anyway, James, thank you for thank you for showing us and inspiring all of us. I say that on behalf of all the people who have been with us. Thank you again. Um, I think this is going to get passed around quite a bit. Um, and I know that a lot of people are going to want to hear your voice. 